Greetings, warriors, veterans, and America-loving citizens from sea to shining sea. Welcome to Frontlines of Freedom. I'm Colonel Danny Gillum. Thank you for joining us. Now it's time to meet my good friend Chip Campbell. Chip's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and retired naval officer. He's also in the process of retiring from Ford Motor Company. He failed retirement the first time. Welcome back to Frontlines of Freedom, Chip. Thank you, Danny. Glad to be here today. Share this uh, forum with you. Chip, let's start with your military service. When, why did you decide to take a shot at Annapolis? Uh, what was that process like? Well, it was, uh, I'll say, a, a, a lifelong process. My, I come from a military family, and I'd always wanted to fly. My dad was a Marine. But at, when the opportunity came up, I said, you know what, I'd like to go into the Navy. I'd like to serve as an officer. And this was when I was basically solidifying it in high school, my junior year. And at that point, I applied to both the Naval Academy and to the Navy ROTC programs. I received the ROTC scholarship and hadn't heard from the Academy, um, and I was getting a little concerned. But I was all set to go to the University of Missouri on an ROTC scholarship. But then I got my appointment to the Naval Academy, and there's no doubts about it. Uh, I went to the Academy. And uh, my dad had been there at one point. Uh, he got pulled out as part of World War II and uh, went off to fight. So I was able to continue that tradition. So what did you do on active duty? Were you a pilot? Uh, no, I was a naval flight officer, navigator, or as people refer to it from uh, Top Gun, I was Goose, sitting in the back seat. Uh, my specialty was anti-submarine warfare chasing submarines. Most of my uh, active duty was spent flying the the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. And uh, during that time, this was the Cold War period, and our job was to keep track of the uh, Soviet subs and the Soviet boomers that were off the east coast of the U.S. to uh, just make sure we knew where they were at all times, and if required, we'd know uh, where they are and we could go after them. In the Mediterranean, it was uh, pretty much keeping on top and watching the, uh, the Russian fleet out there working with our allies to make sure that the uh, area was, you know, safe and secure. And again, if hostilities got rough, that we were ready to go. I was also lucky my squadron, um, when I was in the squadron, the Iranian crisis, the 1979 type 1980 program had happened. And we were able to, uh, I'll say, have a cross fleet type deployment where I got the opportunity to go out to Westpac and uh, flew in the Philippines uh, Diego Garcia up to Oman. Uh, we're watching the uh, Iranians from there and flew some missions up there. Quite a pretty educational time in our life. Again, I was the what you call the Cold War warrior. I started in active duty in '76, and by the time I retired in uh, 2001, it was August of 2001. We were still officially in the Cold War at that point in time. But uh, as we know, a month later, things rapidly changed. Indeed. Well, I want you to know that during the Iran crisis, I was watching you. I was a Mideast war planner at that time. Okay. And uh, I was certainly aware of what was going on over there. I just didn't know it was you. Well, there were quite a few of us out there. And it was, uh, again, it was impressive to know that we could project our military power that far. You know, you always heard about it. Not being on a carrier, you never really saw the projection of power uh, overseas, but clearly this was the way to do it, and uh, pretty eye-lightening even for me, uh, even as I was flying through the Mediterranean, but reaching out into the Pacific was really something different. It it certainly was, and uh, all kinds of things went wrong, including our sort of flubbed uh, attempt at recovering the, our hostages. Yes. Uh, so we, we have high points and low points. There ain't nobody perfect out there. But our, our monitoring of the Soviet fleet, particularly the submarines during the Cold War, was as close to perfect as probably anything the government's ever, Department of Defense has ever done. That's my opinion. Is it yours? Right. I, I think we did a great job. We were constantly upgrading our technology uh, from when I first started flying to when uh, I went off uh, uh, active duty and even subsequently when I uh, left the reserves uh, 17 years after active duty. Clearly, our tactics, we were probably the best, except potentially, I think the Norwegians and the Brits were giving us a run for our money at times when we did shared exercises with them. But uh, overall, I think, you know, we were pretty far along. We knew what we were doing. Uh, we had many sources of information that we could leverage. My aircraft was just one of them. And I think we, we were pretty much real time and could perform our mission and get a torpedo on top as required very quickly if, if the time ever came. So I felt pretty comfortable with that. 
Um, I think the Navy and the country put a lot of effort and money into our anti-submarine warfare programs. I think that's something we're, we're kind of we've lacked in the last several years as our war on terror, global war on terror, kind of moved to a land campaign. But now as things are shifting and the Russians are coming back on board and increasing their presence and other folks are building up their submarines uh, forces that, um, you know, that once again, I think we're starting to refocus uh, the use of our P3s or P8s now uh, on their true mission, which is anti-submarine warfare. And I'm sure glad they're there. This is Colonel Denny Gillum on Frontlines of Freedom. We're discussing a second upcoming retirement with an American patriot, my buddy Chip Campbell. Okay, once you got off active duty, did you go directly to Ford? Uh, Denny, I did. Matter of fact, my it was an interesting transition. I was uh, my last shore duty on active duty was with uh, as a senior class instructor and aviation officer at the University of Michigan Navy ROTC unit. While I was there for three years, I also worked on an uh, evening program for my MBA. So when my time came to uh, make a just have the decision point at the end of my three-year shore tour. So either back to the fleet or go into the civilian world, I uh, transitioned and, and resigned my active duty commission and went to work, was in the Navy one week and was at Ford the next week and joined the Naval Reserves the week after that. So really didn't skip a beat. Uh, it was a very positive transition in that Ford and today, much as we are today. Um, very highly respect and seek those veterans who can fill our positions at Ford. I was welcomed. It was clearly made known to me that one of the reasons I was being hired above all other things was because I was a veteran. And uh, Ford has a long tradition of working with veterans, working with the military. And um, I was just uh, a reflection of that. What did you do for him? I was a corporate finance person. So I basically uh, did different roles that related to finance throughout the company. And probably one of the most fascinating jobs I had was right during the uh, industry meltdown, 2007, 8, and 9, I was uh, doing what we call distressed supplier work. And I was, uh, there was a select few of us, along with some outside consultants and our legal counsel, we were working uh, with our suppliers who just you know, just trying to keep the doors open and getting parts to us. Um, we're right in the midst of things, working not only with our own supply, our own purchasing people, but also interfacing and uh, sitting on the other side of the table at times with our other uh, counterparts, be it GM, Chrysler, Toyota, because we're all trying to keep that supply base going. And we're all still trying to get our parts, you know, not necessarily to the benefit of the other uh, OEM sitting there at the table. But it was a really fascinating uh, and then my last last rotation where I've been now is working on a corp, back at corporate finance, working on a new global profit reporting system. And all that is now about to wrap up. Indeed, you had your last day at work last week sometime, didn't you? I did. It was actually uh, December 7th, which... Uh, Appropriate for a Navy guy, <laughs> Pearl Harbor Day. I, I, I didn't want to detract from what that day really means to all of us, but uh, clearly it was uh, it is kind of somewhat coincidental that that was my uh, last physical day at work. Well, folks, Skip is going to stay with us, and we're going to continue talking about Pearl Harbor Day. That was the 75th anniversary that we just went through. And my final thought on Ford, I really appreciate Ford. I drive a Ford. And one of the reasons I do it is because back in that financial crisis time, you guys didn't take a buyout from the government. You guys stood up like a company and made it happen. So my final salute to Ford. Well, thank you, Danny. I know it's, uh, it was a very it was a hard time for us to get through that. But I know as a company, we all felt very proud that we were able to do that. And it's, it's, it's done well for us since then. To, it makes people appreciate the company and what we've done uh, even more so, especially when I'm trying to recruit folks. They tend to always remember that. You didn't take the money. Amen. And that was really nice. So, folks, as I said, I'm not going to let Chip go yet. We're going to talk some more about Pearl Harbor Day. This is Colonel Denny Gillum on Frontlines of Freedom. Troops, you have time for bench presses. Start with your personal weight in pounds, nice and slow. The slower you go, the better it is for you. Then rehydrate with water. I want you healthy. Then take a break and stay in the area. We'll be right back. This is Colonel Denny Gillum. We're at the final formation for this hour on Frontlines of Freedom. 
We're continuing our conversation with retired Naval officer and Ford employee Chip Campbell. Chip, last week was the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. As an American and as an Army guy, I've studied and I'm concerned about what happened there that day. However, it really hit our Navy. That's why I'm pleased that you could take a little bit of time to join us today and discuss it from that perspective. Chip, give us an overview of the attack on Pearl Harbor from your perspective. Well, again, I've, I've been like you. I've, I've studied it, uh, and I've actually physically walked and driven the area there as a young midshipman. I remember coming into Pearl Harbor, stand manning the rails, and and as we went by the Arizona, rendering a salute, uh, it really brought it home as to to what that was all about. From my perspective, what I've read is the military at that time tended to be a little bit more parochial, and I think that was somewhat of our downfall and our unpreparedness for what happened that day, December 7th, 1941. Um, a lot of people, you know, were pointing fingers at each other, but I just think overall we just weren't clued in and we weren't on that military footing that, uh, we, I, you know, I think we find ourselves better today as far as being prepared for the uh, unexpected. Uh, it is an emotional area for those who have been there to Pearl Harbor, to go through the harbor, to walk the Arizona Memorial, to drive through the pass where the Japanese planes came in from the north into the harbor area, totally by surprise. Uh, it was a day that I think it really hit the country hard, on the other hand, as the Japanese found it, woke a sleeping giant. Skip, Japan, their thought was that if they took out Pearl Harbor, they could finish their occupation of the countries they wanted to in the Far East before we could recover, and then it would be a fait accompli. They would never have to fight us. Is that how you remember it? Uh, to some extent, that's correct, Any although I think their mission was to take out our carriers also. And when they came into the harbor, there were no carriers. And I think post-analysis, they realized that even though they took out a major portion of our surface fleet, and primarily the capital battleships, they still missed the carriers, and it was going to be a long road. They didn't necessarily accomplish what they wanted to. But, yes, I think it was a surprise to knock us back, hopefully take out our fleet so they could just continue their expansion into the western Pacific and the southeast Pacific. But as we all know, that uh, it was a struggle from – from that point on, the next six to eight months were very, very depressing, very rough time for the Allies, specifically the Australians, New Zealanders, and the Americans, and the Dutch against, and the Brits against the, uh, the Japanese expansion there. Yeah, we had a number of carriers there, four or five of them, but they were out on a training maneuver. Is that what happened? I think a couple were on training, a couple were still on the uh, out on the West Coast, but they basically. Yeah, they just weren't there at that point in time. The Saratoga, the Enterprise, I think the Ranger, um, and they just they just weren't around. And lucky for us, they weren't. Indeed, this is Colonel Danny Gillum on Frontlines of Freedom. We're discussing the attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii on seven December nineteen forty one. We're talking with retired naval officer Chip Campbell. So. I remember reading that the president and the generals and admirals had figured out that Japan was up to something, and they had somehow determined that a Japanese fleet had set sail, but the, the fleet was headed some other direction, towards Singapore or something, they thought, when in fact they did that as a deception and then turned direction and headed towards Pearl Harbor. We were looking for something, but we had, didn't have a clue that it was Pearl Harbor, did we? No, we, we didn't. And as a matter of fact, I think that's what... If you think about it, that's why we, even though we had a, a radar station set up on the west coast of uh, Oahu that did pick up the inbound attack formations coming in from the carriers, they just didn't believe it could happen. We didn't think the Japanese were any, within any range of the islands uh, based on, as you described, the deception, and then they went total MCON radio silence. And so I was quite a surprise. We weren't anticipating the worst, and therefore, Things slipped by before, and then it was too late. And the Army Air Corps field had a lot of fighters and bombers, but they were all lined up, dressed right and covered down, like we normally keep things for maintenance and security and everything, which made it pretty easy for strafing. As I recollect, I can remember seeing pictures of that. Right. Yeah, I agree. Hickam Field, uh, line wingtip to wingtip, so, so also at Fort Island, 
and the Navy uh, was there in the outlying fields also. They were wingtip to wingtip. The, the thinking was it was easier to guard them from a some type of attack, although nobody seemed to be thinking if it was an aerial attack, you just lined them up like sitting ducks, and that's exactly what happened. They didn't disperse them. And the net result was chaos. Lives lost, lots of people shocked. Nobody knew what the heck to do. But one of the things about we military folks is we sort of recover and start making plans for what to do next. And that did happen, didn't it? Right. I think um, we were already, our, our industrial base had already, through President Roosevelt's actions, had already started, um, you know, building up its ability to produce armaments as part of the Lend Lease program to the Brits and our other allies who were already fighting in Europe at the time. This was the impetus to kick it into high gear. Uh, we had also started stepping up about a year or two previously our uh, pilot training. I, I think there was some foresight in some folks to see this, this freight train was coming our way and to start getting people ready. Also, we had you know new aircraft and ships under development that uh, basically came home by the time 1943-44. We were starting to, to improve and get rid of our obsolete equipment. So... But again, it was it was a long road, Denny. You know, they we just like I said, we weren't ready and uh, weren't reading the tea leaves too well until it was a little late. But uh, I think things picked up, and, and as you can see, it did prove that even though we're down, the Americans were not out until the final breath. And the the next day, I believe President Roosevelt went before Congress and asked for a declaration of war and got it. Yes, he and, did. And that's the last time in history the United States. Congress has declared war. Uh, right. Subsequent wars didn't work that way. And we mobilized the whole country. Indeed, I'm fond of telling people if you ever get a 1944 Ford, it's got four wheel drive and a, a dash mount for a machine gun because it's called a Jeep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not just Ford, but all of our industry mobilized to make the war footing. We had rationing for food and gasoline and you name it. And we went to war and we won. And it was hard, it was long, it was bloody, but we got focused and we did it. And what America was sort of isolationist before World War I. We didn't want to get into that, but we did for the final year. We were quite isolationist. We wanted to let Europe fight their war and Asia fight their war, and we wanted to stay out of it. But the attack on Pearl Harbor brought us into World War II, and we provided the leadership and the people and the stuff to lead to a victory, and by golly, we did lead to victory. Chip, thank you. Thanks for taking time to talk about this. Thank you for your service to our nation and the Navy, and God bless you as you go into retirement, brother. I hope you don't flunk retirement like you did the first time. Yeah, I hope not, and thank you for your service. 